Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India What Paul Fairbank has to say about the method of science? What should be the method or methods of science? Historically, I mean we have already discussed inductivism, hypotheticism, positivism, uh, the views uh, of Popper and Kuhn uh, and so on. Now, let us see what Paul Fairbank has to say. Okay? These are eminent scholars who have propounded on, uh, on the methods of science. Okay? It does not imply that with Paul Farabend the debate is over. Just for the sake of convenience, we have tried to look at this. I mean, uh, even we can look at Lakatos, we can look at Larry Lauden, we, are, we can look at uh, Barnes, uh, we can look at uh, Steve Fuller and so on. But, but for but given the course mm, in place, we are trying to look at uh, till Fairbank. Okay? Then we will uh, move to uh, uh, other uh, important issues uh, in science, technology, and society. Okay? Paul Fairbank, in his classic against method outline of an anarchistic theory of knowledge in 1975 repudiates the very idea of scientific method. Both on grounds of logic and history, Farabend calls into question the time honored belief that there is something called the method of science which distinguished science from the rest of our cognitive activities. I mean he questioned, he interrogated the very idea of which was propounded by inductivists, hypothesists, positivists, Popper and Kuhn. This, this the, that, uh, that science is distinct from other areas of human activity or creativity. Okay? And such that science, science is different from uh, uh, other areas of human activity or creativity uh, uh, on the basis of uh, cognition. This traditional view about science which is called by Farabend law and order philosophy of science, which maintains that, that there are certain unchanging norms which determine scientific practices. Then certain norms in the traditional view of science, in the traditional account of science okay, cannot be changed, such norms. And they, these, these unchanging norms. Uh, often determine scientific practices and this law and order philosophy of science okay, was questioned, was interrogated by Paul Farabend. Okay. Though for, for according to Farabend, though philosophers of science as we have seen in the, in the accounts of positivism, hypothesism, uh, positivism, uh, uh, Popperian and Kuhnian methodologies. Okay, differ in their account of what they consider to be the method or methods of science, all of them maintain that there are at least two conditions which ought to be met with by any theory that is proposed for acceptance. According to Farabend, these conditions can be called consistency condition and correspondence condition. Okay. Then what is this consistency condition? What is this correspondence condition? According to the con consistency condition, the new theory must be consistent with the already well established theories. On the other hand, 
according to the correspondence condition the new theory must correspond to the well established facts. According to Fairabend both consistency as well as correspondence conditions are illegitimate invalid in the sense that their acceptance hinders the progress of science. If we accept any of the conditions whether consistency condition or correspondence condition then it obstructs the cumulative progress of science. Okay? <coughs> On what count then? For, for Fairabend by insisting upon the consistency condition the traditional philosophers of science both positivists as well as Popperian overlook the fact that the so called well established theories may themselves be faulty. Their faulty character might come to surface only if we allow acceptance of the new theory provisionally. In other words, if a new theory is inconsistent with the existing theories which you which we believe to be uh, uh, extremely well supported the fault may not necessarily with uh, may not necessarily be with the new theory, but with the latter with with the old theories with the with the existing ones uh, whose serious limitations may become obvious to us, us only by adopting an alternative theory. That is to say that this is where this is the, the problem if we follow consistency condition. Then what kind of problem that we are going to encounter if we follow the if we insist on mm, the correspondence condition. By insisting upon the correspondence condition we may be thwarting the chances of a very good theory and remain blind to the serious lacuni of the existing theories which we might miss only because we remain confined to these theories. However, we may never become aware of these new facts unless we transcend these theories and adopt an alternative just as we cannot become aware of all the defects of our society unless we look at it from the point of view of another society. Okay? That, that's why uh, when, when, uh, when there was sati, uh, suppose in, the, in sociological terms if I say uh, 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 when there was sati, when sati was practiced even, even we know uh, in some parts of the country even today sati is practiced, but uh, and that is that uh, that uh, bride uh, is burnt alive uh, along with the dead groom uh, 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 and it, it, it was a cultural practice uh, for centuries. When the British questioned this, when Raja Ramon Roy questioned this, how did they question it? On the basis of science, on the basis of looking at such practices, such evil practices of, uh, uh, of one's own society vis a vis the other societies. Okay? Such evil practices, uh, the, the, such, such practice of sati uh, uh, used to be considered the norm, it's, it was a rule. But such practices were questioned, were interrogated only by looking at other societies, other progressive societies, other developed societies. Okay? That is why uh, we may never become aware of these new facts unless we transcend these theories and adopt an alternative just as we cannot become aware of all the defects of our society unless and until we look at it from the point of view of another society. Okay? It is very important to look at all possible vantage points. That is why um, uh, the usage of suppose uh, when Weber used the term uh, cognitive empathy to understand the need of the other, the, to understand the role of the other. How are you going to judge yourself only when? you look at your point from the standpoint of others. Okay? This, this is very important. Similarly, the correspondence condition too cannot be sustained. By insisting upon the correspondence condition, 
the traditional philosophers of science according to Feyerabend overlook the fact that the new theory might fail to correspond to facts because facts themselves may degenerate to the sense that they are interpreted consciously or otherwise in terms of a theory which is itself questionable and whose questionability we have not realized since our thinking has been constrained by it. Given the fact, given the uh, fact that all observations are theory laden, in fact Popper, Popper argued in favor of this, it may be that, uh, that what we consider to be observationally obvious might be absolutely wrong due to the incorrectness of the theory. Hence, Feyerabend says that a new theory must be allowed to grow even if it goes against well known facts. It may be mentioned here that of the two conditions, the correspondence condition is more primary because the consistency condition can be reduced to it. For the consistency condition, for the consistency condition says that a new theory must be consistent with existing theories if the latter are supported by facts. In other words, the consistency condition seeks to guarantee that a new theory corresponds with new known facts by being consistent with existing theories and Feyerabend rejects both theory, both conditions. By rejecting both conditions, Feyerabend advocates that a new theory should not be constrained by the rule that it should first correspond with facts which we already know. In fact, Feyerabend says that we must make deliberate attempt to develop theories which go uh, uh, counter to the so called known facts. Thus, Feyerabend tried to object, tried to repudiate the very law and order philosophy of science. Now, uh, Feyerabend uh, in fact goes one step further. Okay. He challenges uh, his traditional opponents. Uh, namely Popper, Kuhn, positivists, inductivists, hypothesis and so on by saying, let me quote Feyerabend from against method, he says, give me any norm you like, I will show that it is violated in at certain important phases in the history of science, not by oversight or negligence, but consciously and deliberately. I repeat give me any norm you like, I will show that it is violated at certain important phases in the history of science, not by oversight or negligence, but consciously and deliberately. Okay. According to Feyerabend, in the most productive periods of science, of any science, if I, if we can ex explicate this, this statement, give me any norm you like, I uh, will show that it is violated at certain important phases in the history of science, not by oversight or negligence, but consciously and deliberately. If we try to explicate this, then we see that according to Feyerabend, in the most productive uh, periods of any science, scientists found themselves in situations which are too complex to be tackled by simple rules of thumb, which philosophers of science glorify as methodological norms. Those rules of thumb became methodological norms for philosophers of science. Since science in its history has violated every possible norm, we must give up the very idea of the scientific method. Does Feyerabend mean that our new theory should not have any empirical basis? No, never. He never meant that. All that Feyerabend says is that we must not insist on our theories must not insist that our theories must have empirical basis the very moment they are generated. They must be allowed to grow, they must be allowed to develop their empirical basis instead of being nipped in the, in the end for the sole reason that existing theories and known facts do not support them. Okay? In this connection, Feyerabend discusses in detail the case of Galileo. We all know that Galileo sought to replace the geocentric theory of Ptolemy by the heliocentric theory of Copernicus. 
it must be mentioned that the that most of the known facts were in harmony with the Ptolemaic theory. Okay? Uh, of course, indeed there were many observations which prima facie were against the Ptolemaic theory, but the followers of Ptolemy can yet to take care of such recalcitrant facts by making suitable adjustments in their theory. In a nutshell, in sum, going by the well established observations and known facts, okay, uh, the Ptolemaic theory had definitely an edge over the uh, uh, Copernican theory initially. Hence, Galileo rightly did not try to get support from already known facts for the Copernican view. Instead, he tried to come out with some uh, with new observations using telescope. But Galileo's rival questioned the rivals questioned the legitimacy of extending the use of telescope observations from terrestrial to the celestial sphere. Okay. Galileo, as we have seen, could have answered his opponents by propounding a theory of light which which would justify telescopic observations. Galileo similarly required many such auxiliary theories to justify the new facts which he insisted in support of the Copernican theory. Galileo's rivals on the one hand were no doubt uh, uh, I mean uh, right in demanding them. But on the other Galileo was convinced that these auxiliary theories could be developed once the Copernican theory passes through on the basis of however slender and yet to be substantiated observational evidence. So, that the new theory could build for itself enormous amount of empirical basis in terms of new observations. Once the new theory stands on its own feet, the old observations and facts which were taken to support the Ptolemaic theory came to be interpreted in the light of the new theory. Had Galileo taken the correspondence condition seriously, okay, as was, I mean even Farabend rejected correspondence condition, right? I mean, had Galileo taken the correspondence condition seriously and endeavored to enlist the support of the known facts, he would not have been able to bring about a revolution which he did. Thus, it is not that observations come first, is the theory which subsequently develops and observational basis for itself. Marx recognizes this when he says science like uh, a science unlike other architects builds not only castles in the air, <laughs> but may construct separate habitable story of the building before laying the foundation stone. Since according to Farabend scientific practice at its best does not go by any set norms, we cannot discourage any theory which we which might go against the so called well known facts. Calling himself an anarchist, Farabend vehemently argues that any approach or view however bizarre or eccentric okay, has the uh, right for continued existence. Okay. That is to say a view which goes against the well known facts has as initial justification as the new uh, 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 or sorry, so uh, I mean a view which goes against the well known facts has as initial justification as the view which is consistent with the known facts. Instead of killing, instead of rejecting a new theory just because it goes against known facts, we must allow it to grow or to die a natural death consequent upon its failure to build for itself an empirical basis. Thus, Farabend very effectively pleads for tolerance in the case of those theories which may not find support from what we already know. It may be mentioned that uh, it may be mentioned against Farabend against Farabend that such a tolerance will lead to the mushroom growth of theories. And interestingly, uh, uh, without doubt, uh, uh, Farabend accepts this consequence of his position as a positive feature, I mean mushrooming, mushroom growth of theories. It is a positive feature. He strongly advocates proliferation of theories. Scientists who work in a certain domain must work with more than one theory since there is no norm which decides beforehand which one of the theories is more plausible. 
in other words consistent with his rejection of the idea that there are set norms which guide scientific thinking Feyerabend calls for pluralism in scientific practice the idea of one theory at a time has no basis once it is shown that scientific practice at its creative best has uh, thrown to winds every conceivable norm and finally like kuhn Feyerabend maintains that the relationship between successive theories in science is incommensurable. I mean that is what incommensurability thesis I that is why I gave you the example of secularism and uh, communalism. Uh, I can I can go a little step further I can say secularism and uh, religion belief in secularism and belief in religion okay. they, they, they can also constitute uh, constitute incommensurability thesis in, in, in certain in certain contexts. Okay. Uh, secularism and communi communalism obviously there uh, they they constitute incommensurability thesis okay i mean opposed categories the, uh, the there must be uh, the new one uh, must be incom the new paradigm in science must be incommensurable with the old one or the existing one in fact Farabend provides new arguments in favor of the incommensurability thesis propounded by kunitz himself. To appreciate the novelty of Feyerabend's approach to scientific practice, we must juxtapose his views with those of positivists Popper and Kuhn. In what sense? We are always trying to compare right. We also compared uh, uh, Popper with Kuhn, we compared inductivists with hypothesists. Uh, uh, again, uh, we hypothesis with positivists, positivists with Popper, Popper with Kuhn. Now, now we are trying to make a comparison. Okay, we, we are trying to make a, a comparison of Feyerabend's views vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the views of positivists Popper and Kuhn. First, as we have seen, both positivists and Popper maintain the thesis of methodological monism that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter. Since this method is supposed to be adopted well by natural sciences, social sciences are advised to follow natural sciences. That is why social sciences were modeled on the basis of natural sciences. Social sciences borrowed so much from the natural sciences, I mean methodology. Even Kuhn implicitly maintains that social sciences can achieve progress only by following natural sciences whose distinctive mark according to Kuhn is their success in developing a normal tradition. I mean the transition that is why uh, Kuhn made a distinction between astronomy, physics, chemistry and biology on the one hand and creative areas like uh, uh, art, literature, music, philosophy and even medicine on the other right. That is why he said. Uh, uh, own social sciences may not enter I mean I mean it is impossible for social sciences to uh, enter the paradigmatic stage from pre paradigmatic stage because of the nature of the problems re nature of research questions involved and that is why uh, the, the way Kuhn implicitly maintains that social sciences can achieve progress only by following natural sciences whose distinctive mark according to uh, him according to Kuhn is their success in developing a normal tradition because normal tradition is found only uh, within a particular paradigm not in the pre paradigmatic stage. Okay. Against the methodological monism that, that, uh, that uh, there is only one method uh, common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter okay. such such uh, uh, arguments against methodological monism. Many social scientists argue that social sciences need to have a method different from that of natural sciences thanks to the peculiar uh, subject matter of their study, nature of the study. In this process, an influential school of thought which went by the name of Verstehen school that dominated social sciences in general and German scene of social sciences in particular maintain what is called methodological dualism. What Verstehen means understanding in German Verstehen means understanding. Uh, it was used mostly in the works of Max Weber. He said uh, 
uh, um, I mean understanding of social action. Okay. This uh, uh, understanding can be uh, direct understanding can be indirect understanding, direct understanding is alternatively known as observational understanding, indirect understanding is also known as explanatory understanding of social action. Okay. What Weber tried to do here, uh, tried to explain in the context of Verstehen that knowledge is generated at two levels. I mean Weber, Weber's theoretical and methodological canons, methodological positions are a reconciliation between positivism and neo Kantianism. Positivism you know, I mean the methodological canons of science, okay? objectivity of science. Okay? Neo Kantianism suggests that the world that we see, the knowledge that we produce, generate okay, is a subjective one, which involves selection and interpretation. Okay? That is why Kant also wrote no critic to pure reason. I mean that is a different story altogether. I mean uh, uh, we need not, uh, I mean we can still go on and on, but, but for our convenience, I mean uh, for given, given the core structure, we, we must restrict our movement now. Okay? This, this that knowledge is subjective, that our knowledge of the world is subjective, our knowledge of the world is not absolute, okay? that was also pointed out by, by Popper. That is why he used the term no, very similitude, close to truth, but not truth itself. Truth likeness, truth nearness. Okay. But, but the method which, which was propounded by Verstehen school of thought, okay, it maintains that no, we do not require methodological monism, rather methodological plural, uh, uh, dualism. Okay. We require both objectivity as well as subjective perceptions about the knowledge that we create, that we generate. Okay. The Verstehen school of thought contended that the aim of natural sciences was explanation and that of social sciences understanding with the result their methods radically differ from each other. Okay. Explanation comes under the rubric of positivistic school of thought, whereas understanding comes under the rubric of neo Kantian school of thought. Or, uh, and subsequently, we, we, we uh, uh, attribute understanding to Weberian uh, school of thought. Okay? And this, this is methodological dualism, we, but, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, inductivists, hypothesis, positivists, um, I mean, I mean uh, popper, uh, I mean especially positivists if you look at, okay? for them knowledge can be generated only through explanation. Okay, methodological monism. For, for the Verstehen school of thought, for the proponents of Verstehen school of thought, okay, for them it is, it is not simply explanation, it is not simply methodological monism, but also one more aspect is there. It is very important understanding of social action. Okay. Then if I, if I say understanding of social action, okay, that comes under neo Kantian school of thought. Okay. That is why uh, combined together explanation and, and understanding, okay, they constitute methodological duality in the school of social sciences, in the, source, in, the uh, in the framework of social sciences. However, Verstehen school contended to its opponents that is that there is something called the method of natural sciences. Farabend's rejection of methodological monism is more radical than that of methodological dualists, which the Verstehen school of thought propagated, since he repudiates both the very idea that there is something called the method in natural sciences, that there is something called the method in natural sciences, the method. Okay? According to Farabend's methodological pluralism, neither natural sciences nor social sciences have one method.
cannot afford to have only one method. There cannot be the method of, method of science or uh, uh, there cannot be a set of methods of science, but there are multiple methods of science uh, which can uh, help in the furtherance of knowledge production. Okay? That is why not simply methodological monism or methodological dualism, met, uh, not simply methodological monism as positivists propounded, not simply methodological dualism as the Verstehen school of thought propounded, okay? but we require methodological pluralism as uh, Farabelt propounded. Okay? Secondly, by pleading for by pleading for proliferation of theories and the need for methodological pluralism, Farabend stands against Kuhn who virtually celebrates the fact that in natural sciences there is a qualitatively a greater consensus than in social sciences. I mean in that is why uh, as there is a qualitatively as there is a qualitatively greater consensus in so natural sciences natural sciences namely astronomy, uh, physics, chemistry and biology, they make a transition from pre-paradigmatic stage to the paradigmatic stage. As there is uh, relatively less consensus, uh, in fact, it is, uh, I mean, uh, the, it is very difficult to arrive at a consensus in the social sciences. Uh, uh, it is a different question altogether. Uh, whether it is desirable to have a consensus or not. Okay? Uh, philosophically uh, speaking, uh, even, even ethically speaking, I will say it is not desirable to have a consensus, even in natural sciences uh, uh, or in social sciences. I mean, it is not desirable. Okay? Mm. That is why uh, we always talk about multiculturalism uh, 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 in a context of democratic setup. Okay? That, is, that is another thing. But uh, but what I mean here is that the way uh, Farabend stands against Kuhn, as Kuhn virtually celebrates the, that uh, the fact, uh, I mean celebrates the fact that in natural sciences there is a qualitatively greater consensus than in social sciences. For Farabend, even if Kuhn is right in his description of the actual scientific practice, he is not justified in thinking that the monolithic state of affairs is the ideal. In other words, Kuhn's idea of paradigmatic stage as the ultimate phase of scientific evolution, Farabend advocates the need for post paradigmatic stage in which scientific practice is characterized by plurality. Finally, let us put it thus, positivists Popper and Kuhn in different ways sought to show how science is unique. Whereas, according to positivists, the uniqueness of science among our various types of cognitive activities like common sense, art, religion, etc., consists in the systematic verifiability of scientific claims. According to Popper, it is systematic falsifiability of scientific claims and it is consensus according to Kuhn. All the three positivists Popper and Kuhn sought to draw a line of demarcation between science and non-science and by doing so presented science as a type of knowledge seeking activity which is not only unique in itself but also as exemplifying an ideal which the other modes of cognizing the world must emulate. Farabend repudiates the possibility of drawing a line of demarcation between science and non-science. This does not imply that according to him there is no difference between science and say religion or art. He only, Farabend only maintains that such a line of demarcation keeps shifting with the result, the line of, the line is uh, not absolute uh, and logical, but relative to an age, to an epoch, to an era and is historically conditioned. In fact, Kuhn also suggested that, that science must be examined in terms of its historical integrity. But, but the way Farabend leapt one step further, okay, that, uh, that uh, such a line of demarcation between science and non-science keeps shifting, okay, keeps altering their stances 
with the result with the outcome okay and the line is not absolute and the line is also not logical it is spontaneous it is relative to a historical epoch that's why they are socially